Welcome to session six of training for reaching the unreached. I call this training the trainers. That means all of you are potential trainers, training other servants of God, training disciples, training harvest workers for these last days. Session six. If you'd like to have the videos of this session in addition to all future sessions, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Uh, this presentation is also available, so email me and I'll give you the link by which you can download this presentation. Uh, by the way, I am constantly updating this presentation, so if you have downloaded an earlier version, please be sure to go back to that same link and download the latest version of this presentation. Now, let's go to slide three, nine, six, and continue. I'd like to give you a few testimonies of miraculous healing from COVID-19. Nowadays, the focus of the entire world is on this virus. Uh, many people are deathly afraid of it. And I believe we can use this crisis to proclaim the kingdom of God by performing miraculous healings from people who have this disease. So I'm going to share with you a few testimonies from among several. And this one I received just earlier today. Okay. This morning, that is Thursday, May 13, I received an email from Joe, a disciple of Jesus Christ. I don't know where Joe lives. I think somewhere in the US. And this is what he wrote me. We attended our men's gathering over the past weekend, and now this week several of the men have been tested positive with COVID-19. So this morning I woke up and I feel like there is some sickness trying to affect my health. I felt I was supposed to reach out to you today and see if maybe I could call one of your team members and have them pray over me. We have several guys that I would love to call and rebuke the sickness off of if you are willing to help me out today. And so I put Joe in contact with our trained coworker, whose name is Sam Dolan, who lives in Louisiana. Later that same morning, Joe emailed me and this is what he wrote. Thank you so much. I put brother Eddie on a conference call and we both had Sam minister to us. Uh, Sam is the brother in Louisiana. We both feel so much better. I had aches in my back and I was overall just feeling bad. And my brother Eddie had a headache and sinus. But as Sam ministered to them right over the telephone, all those symptoms just disappeared. I was so encouraged by this that I immediately called and ministered to another brother who had back pain and sinus plugged up and his sinus all opened and his pain left him. I could audibly hear the difference in his voice and it was a big faith builder for me as well. Now this is Joe writing and Joe uh, actually all he has done is looked at our PowerPoint presentation. He has actually not sat through the training. All right. But now the Lord is already using him to minister healing at a distance over the phone. So email me if you'd like to minister healing to people with COVID who contact us for help. I sense that more and more people are going to be emailing us and asking us to pray over them to minister to them because they have COVID-19. What I like to do is I like to farm them out. I like to refer them to one of you. If one of you would like to be put on a list of trained servants of God who know how to minister with authority over the phone, and if you'd like to minister supernatural healing to people with COVID-19, uh, let me know, email me, let me know after this is over that you would like to be put on that list. So in the future, when I get requests over uh, to our website over email from people who have COVID-19 and who are requesting healing, I will refer them to those on the list. 
so, okay? And again, let's use this as an opportunity to preach the name of Jesus. Again, everyone knows about COVID-19. Everyone, at least the, the unbelievers, most of the unbelievers are deathly afraid of it. So let us quote unquote, take advantage of this crisis and use it to perform many miraculous healings for people who have this disease. And then after that, we tell them that the one who healed you of this, of this terrible disease is the one who can forgive you of your sins and grant you eternal life. You see, that's the connection. The one who heals people of COVID-19 is the one who has authority to forgive their sin and grant them eternal life. So again, if you want to have opportunities to minister healing to people with COVID, just email me and let me know. Now, the consequence of doubting that we can do what the Lord commands us to do. Now, we've already studied this, of course. We know that the consequence of doubting is failure. Nothing happens when you doubt. Let's look at a very, very graphic instance of this. We're going to look at Peter sinking into the waves as he stepped out of the boat trying to walk on water. Now, this was the second failure of the disciples. You recall the first failure that was in Matthew 17 when the disciples failed to heal the boy with epilepsy and Jesus rebuked them severely, calling them unbelieving and perverse. Okay, and you recall Jesus, yes, rebuking them severely. Now, let's look at the second failure as recorded in the Gospels. Why do we study these failures? So that we know how not to fail, how to obey what God commands us to do, how not to fail to obey his commands. Okay. Peter was in the boat on the Sea of Galilee when he saw Jesus walking on the water. And then Matthew 14, 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, note that before Peter stepped out of the boat, he wisely first asked Jesus for a command to come. What would have happened if Peter stepped out in presumption without a command from the Lord? Well, he could have drowned. All right. So it was very wise of Peter to say, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. What do we learn from this? Well, we learn the following. Let us be careful that the Lord has commanded us before we step into the invisible realm of the spirit. In this invisible realm, there is potential danger. I'm talking about demons, very powerful demons. But if the Lord has already commanded us to step into that invisible realm, then we can enter and operate it in it safely only if he has commanded us to do so. Now, what has the Lord commanded us to do in the realm of the supernatural? Well, we know the Lord has commanded us to heal the sick on earth, among people on earth. We are to cast out demons from people on earth. We are to preach the gospel to people, of course, on earth. We make disciples on earth. And we can do such things safely since we have been commanded to do them. So we can operate in the supernatural in that realm, healing the sick, casting out demons, preaching the gospel. We can do that safely because Jesus commanded us to do them. We only do what he commands us to do. But Jesus never commanded us to engage territorial spirits and principalities in direct strategic level spiritual warfare. Uh, we have looked at this in a past session. Therefore, we cannot engage in such direct spiritual warfare safely. And of course, I would advise you not to engage in such direct spiritual warfare against principalities and territorial spirits unless the Lord has clearly commanded you to do so. Uh, I do not rebuke territorial spirits. I do not talk to them. I do not talk to Satan. No. My... Yeah, I'm a ground troop. My activity is all at ground level. Now, when I pray, of course, 
uh, I pray to God who dwells in the realm of the of the invisible. Yes, and that is safe. You can pray to the Lord safely. If you pray something stupid, the Lord will simply say no, <laughs> no, no. Okay, so prayer uh, never hurts. Okay, but do not seek to directly rebuke territorial spirits, principalities, and powers and authorities, and so because we have not been commanded to do that. When we have not been commanded to do it, yet we do it, we have gone we have gone rogue essentially, and the Lord might not protect us. And so Peter asks Jesus for a command before daring to step out of the boat. Okay, once again, verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Okay, Jesus issued us a issues a command to Peter, come. Now Peter can step out of the boat safely since Jesus had commanded him to come. When you obey the commands of the Lord, he says, nothing by any means will harm you. Now, yes, yeah, sometimes there is persecution, yes. <laughs> but generally, when you obey the command of the Lord, nothing by any means will harm you as he promised. Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came toward Jesus. So far, so good. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, notice that when he allowed fear to come into his heart, the miracle was over and he began to sink. Now, typically, when you study this in a Bible study, what you learn is that Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and instead looked at the wind. And that's when he sank. That's when fear entered his heart, when he took his eyes off of Jesus. All right. That's when the miracle was over. And that's fine. But I believe we can go a lot deeper than that. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Yes. Jesus heard his cry, and of course, Jesus mercifully saved Peter from drowning. Yes. But was Jesus pleased with Peter when he cried out, Lord, save me? Was Jesus pleased with that cry? And the answer is no. And then Jesus said to Peter, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Jesus rebukes Peter for having little faith and for doubting. It was because of his little faith and his doubt that he sank. Now, this is the second time that Jesus rebukes his disciples because of their little faith. This is the second time. The first time was back in Matthew 17 when they failed to cast the demon out of the epileptic boy. You recall that? Let's look at that. The very first failure back in Matthew 17, beginning with verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Meaning, why couldn't we drive the demon out of the boy with epilepsy? He replied, because you have so little faith. Now, what kind of little faith did they have? Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So the reason why they failed to cast the demon out of the boy with epilepsy, it was because they had little mountain moving faith. They did not have faith as a mustard seed. They did not have mountain moving faith. Okay. Now, okay, let's go back to Peter sinking into the waves. Jesus was displeased with Peter and rebukes him. Why? Because he had commanded him to walk on the water and therefore expected him to obey the command fully. Just as he expected his disciples to cast the demon of epilepsy out of the boy in Matthew 17. You see, Jesus had sent his disciples out. He commanded them 
to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and proclaim the kingdom of God. But they failed to cast the demon of epilepsy out of the boy in Matthew 17. They failed to obey his command fully. They tried, but that's not enough. Jesus expected them to obey the command fully, that is to actually drive the demon out of the boy. And when they failed, he was disappointed with them and he rebukes them. In the same way, right here, Jesus commanded Peter to come and Peter stepped out of the boat. Okay, good start. But what happened? Because of his little faith and he doubt, he sank, meaning he failed to obey the command, come. Jesus is our commander in chief. He expects us, his disciples, to obey his commands fully. Peter did not obey his command fully. Halfway there, he sank. Now, why did Peter sink? You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Peter sank because his little faith caused him to doubt. Now, exactly what did Peter doubt, causing him to sink? Now, it is usually taught, and correctly so, that we should not doubt God. Of course, we should never doubt God. We should never doubt his promises. Absolutely. However, is Peter doubting God here? Is that the reason why Peter sank? because he's doubting God? And the answer is no, he's not doubting God. So what is he doubting? Well, is Peter doubting Jesus? Is that why he sank? Is Peter doubting that Jesus can walk on water? Is that why he sank? No, he can see Jesus walking on water. He is not doubting Jesus. Exactly what is Peter doubting here causing him to sink? It is clear that Peter is doubting himself. He is doubting that he could do what Jesus commanded him to do. He is doubting that he could walk on water as commanded by Jesus. He doubted that he himself could walk on water as Jesus had commanded him to do. Now, in doubting that he could walk on water as Jesus had commanded, one could say that Peter had little faith of God or little mountain moving faith. Back in Matthew 17, when they asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus said, it was because of a little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Now here in this second failure, they had the same lack of faith. They lacked faith of God. They lacked mountain moving faith. They doubted. Let's look once again at the definition of faith of God. Matthew eleven twenty two, and answering Jesus said to them, have faith of God. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, faith of God means that when you speak to the mountain, you do not doubt in your heart that you can do it. You believe that what you say will happen. It will be done for him. Peter had doubt. He doubted in his heart that he could walk on water, especially when he saw the wind. And because of that doubt, he had little mountain moving faith. He had little faith of God. And because of that little faith, he failed. He sank. Now, faith in God is different. Faith in God is foundational. Faith in God says, I know the Lord can do it. I know nothing is impossible for God. That's faith 
in God. I know God can save me. I know God can provide for me. I know God can bless me. That's faith in God. I know the Lord can do it. Faith of God is different. Faith of God says, I know I can do it because I have been given the authority, that is, the ability, and I've been commanded by the Lord to do it. And so I know I can do it. This is the same spirit that Caleb had. You remember Caleb and the 12 spies? The other 10, they said, let's not go in there. Those guys are giants. Let's not go into the promised land. Let's not cross the Jordan. No. But Caleb said, no, let's go in. We can certainly do it. Caleb had faith of God. And you recall, only Caleb and Joshua and their descendants were allowed to go into the promised land. Faith of God. Now, every believer has faith in God, and that is saving faith. Yes, that is foundational. That is necessary. But how many disciples have faith of God by which they can do the works of God, by which they can heal the sick and cast out demons effectively and win souls? Sadly, very few disciples have been taught faith of God. Instead, we have been taught a theology of helplessness, which has paralyzed the church until now. Now, where we have not been given any authority in that situation, yes, we pray to God and we exercise faith in God. We wait on God to move the mountain where we have not been given any authority. But where we have been given authority, that's where we exercise faith of God by issuing commands to those things that we want to move into the sea. Where we have been given authority, and we disciples have been given authority over demons and diseases when we are proclaiming the kingdom of God to the lost. And that's where we exercise faith of God by issuing commands to diseases and demons. Now, of course, we can pray first if we want. If you're out there preaching the gospel and there are sick people who want to be healed, if you want, you can pray first to the Lord. But after, And when you pray, you believe that what you have asked, you will receive. And after you pray in Jesus' name, amen, then you open your eyes and then you pull the trigger, you issue commands, you lay hands on the sick. And if you have mountain moving faith, if you have no doubt, it will be done for you. Matthew 17, verse 20, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain or to this demon or to this disease, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So it is not enough just for us to step out of the boat. It's a good start, but we must also walk on water without sinking. It is not enough just to try to heal the sick as Jesus commands us. It's a good start. But we must also heal the sick effectively as evidence to the lost that Jesus is the only way to the Father. In Matthew 17, Jesus fully expected his disciples to be able to cast the demon out of the boy with epilepsy. He expected it. In the same way, when we are sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God, he expects us to be able to heal the sick and cast out demons effectively as evidence to, to the lost that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the only way to the Father. And so we see that authority alone by itself is insufficient for casting out demons. It must be exercised with mountain moving faith or faith of God or faith as a mustard seed with no doubt. So do you want to walk on water? Then first get out of the boat and then do not doubt. Do not doubt when you are healing the sick in the name of Jesus. 
Now, let's look at the third failure as recorded in the Gospels on the part of the disciples. The third failure. Again, why are we concentrating on failures? Because we want to learn what not to do so that we will not fail. I believe that's why these failures are included in the scriptures, so that we learn what to do in order not to fail. We do not want to fail. Matthew 8, verse 23, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Does that sound familiar? Lord, save us. Again, was Jesus pleased with their cry, Lord, save us? Was he pleased? And the answer, as we shall see, is no. Typically, we teach that when we ask the Lord to save us, he is pleased with our cry. And generally, that is true. When you are in a very dangerous situation where you can do nothing, where you are totally helpless, yes, we cry out to the Lord to save us, and he is pleased with our cry. When we cry out to him, it means that we trust him, and that, of course, pleases him. Yes, but is this always true? And the answer is no. In the case of Peter sinking into the waves, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus was not pleased. Jesus rebukes him. How about right here? Well, let's see. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Ah, we see the expression little faith a third time. Little faith. So what did Jesus mean here by little faith? Well, in hermeneutics, we learn that the Bible is consistent with itself. In Matthew 17, when the disciples failed to drive the demon out of the boy with epilepsy, the little faith that they had was little mountain moving faith. And later, when Peter sank into the waves and Jesus said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? That little faith, again, was little mountain moving faith. Peter doubted that he could walk on water as Jesus had commanded him. And when you have doubt, that means you have little mountain moving faith. So in the first two failures, little faith was in fact little mountain moving faith or little faith of God. Now, this is the third instance of failure. So what do you think little faith might mean here? Well, it must mean little mountain moving faith because... Scripture is consistent. Three times Jesus uses the term little faith, and each time it must refer to the same kind of little faith. Not faith in God, but faith of God. They all had faith in God. That's why they cried out to Jesus to save them, because they had faith in him, faith in God. But the kind of faith they were lacking was faith of God by which they could do the miracle that Jesus was expecting them to do. For the third time, Jesus rebukes his disciples for having little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. What kind of little faith did the disciples have? Well, let's see. The men were amazed. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Meaning, the winds and the waves are under his authority. Ah, that word should be familiar by now. Authority. So what kind of little faith did the disciples have? Well, again, in the first two instances where we see little faith, what Jesus meant was his disciples had little mountain moving faith. Therefore, in this third instance of this expression, little faith, it also meant little mountain moving faith. So what did Jesus expect his disciples to do? He expected them to rebuke the winds and the waves. 
Such miracles are not at all uncommon for disciples when preaching the gospel, especially in the open air. The disciples here lacked faith of God. Jesus expected them to rebuke the winds and the waves. He was so tired, he needed his beauty sleep. When he was on land 24 seven, people were looking for him, asking him to heal their loved ones and so forth, and cast demons out of a family member. He was so tired. He needed to sleep. The only place he could sleep would be on a boat in the water. Let me share with you my own testimony of rebuking a storm in North India at an open air evangelistic meeting in the year 2000, 21 years ago. I was on a mission trip. This was my, I think my second mission trip to India. I had been there earlier that same year and we were in the Northeast in the province of Manipur and we were having these open air meetings. We had five of them in a row. We had hired buses and the buses were bringing in the people and the meetings were very, very fruitful. The first three meetings, uh, the gospel would be preached. I was preaching the gospel and then we would minister healing to the sick and many people were getting healed. And as a result, many people were accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Then came the fourth meeting. It was to take place around 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon in this open air field. And I got ready in my hotel room. It was actually not a hotel. Mm, you wouldn't want to stay there. I got ready and then I went out to the field a bit early. And as I arrived on the field, it was already dark. It was only early in the afternoon, but the sky was dark. And uh, the wind was already blowing very strongly in the distance over the mountains. I could see lightning. So it was clear that a very, very bad storm was approaching us. Again, it was already dark. But by then the buses had already arrived and uh, the people had already were already seated uh, on the field. They were getting ready for this event that we were going to have. So since the people were already there, uh, we began the meeting as we usually did with praise and worship. And the storm was approaching. Halfway through the storm, one of my Indian host pastors approached me and he said, Brother William, what do you think if after the praise and worship, we tell everyone to go home? Now, that makes a lot of human sense. This storm is approaching and when it hits, the people are going to scatter. It's going to be disorderly and embarrassing. So let's take pre preemptive action before the storm hits. We will tell the people the meeting is over. You can go home. Well, immediately I told the pastor, no, we are not going to tell the people to go home. Now, what was I thinking? Now, I do not believe this was from the Holy Spirit, but let me tell you what went through my mind. The Lord had blessed us the first three meetings in this open air field and the enemy was not happy so he had sent this storm to stop us. And my answer was no, no, no. The enemy is not going to stop us. So after the praise and worship, I went up to the platform, I grabbed hold of the mic and I told the people, the enemy is not happy with what God has been doing here. And the enemy has sent this storm to stop us. Let us pray and ask the Lord to remove this storm. Now, do you think that is a risky thing to do in front of a crowd of people with a huge storm coming upon you, heading in your direction? And the answer is, yes, it's a, it's a risky thing to do, all right? It's better you just call off the meeting and tell everyone to go home, okay? But I said, Let's pray and ask God to remove this storm. Now, is that risky? 
And the answer is yes. What if after you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and the storm hits? It's embarrassing. It means God did not hear. God could not help us. So there's a risk when you pray to God in such a situation. But do we servants of God doubt? Do we do things out of fear? And the answer is no, we do not. We obey the command of the Lord. And the Lord commands us to proclaim the kingdom of God. And so in front of this crowd of people, I prayed and I asked the Lord to remove the storm. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you think I did after amen? Yes, I opened my eyes and I pointed to the sky in front of the crowd and I spoke to the storm. I spoke to the mountain. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, storm, I rebuke you. Wind, I rebuke you. Clouds, I rebuke you. Rain, I rebuke you. Storm, leave now in the name of Jesus. Now, is that a risky thing to do, speaking directly to a storm in front of a crowd of people? And the answer is yes. That's even more risky because now it's personal between you and the storm. What if after you rebuke the storm, the wind and the rain hit you in the face? That's embarrassing. That's big time failure. But do we servants of God give in to fear? No, we do not. So what do you think happened after I rebuked the storm with all these people watching? Well, God was merciful. God was gracious. He heard me. He saw what I did. He knew my heart. And this storm split in half right before our very eyes. The storm split in half. The approaching storm, one part went miles away to one side. The other part went miles away in the opposite direction. I could see the rain falling in each direction. As I looked left and I looked right, I could see the storm. But in the middle, there was no rain, no wind, no storm. And after that, did I preach the gospel? Oh, did I preach the gospel? And after the preaching, we healed the sick. Many more people were healed. And at the very end of the meeting, people accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior after the preaching and after witnessing the many miracles, especially the miracle of the rebuking the storm. And at the very end, people were coming forward and testifying what Jesus had done for them. And only then did I feel this very, very light drizzle coming down upon us. For me, it was like the dew from heaven, just like drizzle. That's what I witnessed myself. Now, other servants of God whom we have trained have seen the same thing. For example, our coordinator in India, his name was Brother Subhadjana. Uh, at one time before the pandemic, he would go into villages like once or twice a month. And he would announce that he's going to have a feeding event. And so all the villagers, uh, they gather together, hundreds of them, and they gather together. And uh, when he comes, they're all there, all dressed in their best Sunday best. And after he preaches, uh, he heals the sick, and then he feeds the people. On one particular occasion, a storm was approaching. Okay, the meeting had already begun. It was outside and the storm was approaching. And so some people began to get up and head for home. And Subot said to them, no, don't go home. No, 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 stay in your seat. And then he said, watch this. So he looked up and pointed up toward the sky and he rebuked the storm in the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what happened? The storm stopped dead in its tracks. It stopped. And so he continued the meeting. He continued preaching. Then he noticed that the sky was still dark. There was no storm, but the clouds were still there. And so he said to the people, how many of you would like to see the sun? People raised their hands. And then he looked up. He pointed to the sky and rebuked the clouds. And then sunlight broke through the clouds. No, I didn't teach him to do that part. <laughs> Okay, so we have this authority over the weather when we are outside proclaiming the kingdom of God. 
I'm not saying it's 100%, but I believe based on what Jesus expected his disciples to do on the lake when the storm hit the boat, and based on what I have seen in my own ministry, and based on what I have seen in the ministry of those that we have trained, we do have a measure of authority to rebuke storms and winds and rains, especially when we are proclaiming the kingdom of God to the lost. Those of you who are going out to the mission field, yes, you're going to be having open air events. So keep that in mind. Well, let me just share with you about Hurricane Harvey. You may recall in the city of Houston, we were hit by this once in 500 year hurricane called Harvey, and it was the worst storm in the history of our city. Okay. It hit, uh, it was around August, late August, it hit on a Friday, okay, started raining and raining and raining and raining and other areas of Houston were being flooded. But our area in the West was spared until Sunday, when it started raining in our area in West Houston. And according to the weather forecast, we were supposed to get 24 inches of rain in our very community. And so that day, that Sunday, it started to rain. And for the very first time, the street in front of our home was covered with water. It was flooded. Now, our home is built on a slightly elevated area, maybe a few feet higher than the street. And so even though the street was flooded, but it had not reached our house, but it kept raining. It kept raining. And so the flood began to rise. Okay. And I could see it inching toward our front door, up our sidewalk from the street. When it was about 10 feet from our front door, then I realized, hey, I better do something. This is serious. You see, although it was not threatening our lives, but it would cause severe inconvenience. If your home is flooded, you've got problems. It could take months, if not years, to fix up your home. And we travel, we travel a lot internationally and so i realized that if i don't do something we're going to be severely inconvenienced including our ministry so i took my cell phone and i went upstairs second floor to our bedroom and there i turned on this weather app by which i could see the storm from above from a satellite it's a satellite view from above and i could see the storm above our area of Houston. Our area was totally covered by clouds. And so I began to rebuke Harvey in the name of Jesus Christ. I began to rebuke the wind, the rain, the storm. I rebuked Harvey in the name of Jesus. I rebuked the flooding for one entire hour. I was in my bedroom rebuking Harvey, rebuking the flood rebuking the rain, commanding it to stop in the name of Jesus Christ. At the end of an hour, it stopped raining. The flood had not reached our front door, and the flood began to recede back into the street. The next day on TV, they told us the following. They said, yesterday we received a reprieve. We were supposed to get 24 inches but we only got 10 inches instead. I thank God. I thank the Lord. Thank God for the authority that he has given us. Now, this authority is meant primarily to be used over diseases and demons when preaching the gospel, primarily, okay? And so I would not use this authority for my own personal convenience. Uh, by this authority, I mean authority over diseases and demons and also storms. For example, what do I mean by not using it for my own personal convenience? Well, let's say I want to go on a picnic on a Saturday, but uh, it happens that that Saturday morning is starting to rain. Now, would I use my authority to rebuke that storm? No, I, I would not do that. I, I believe that would be misusing the authority. So generally, I don't use it for my own personal convenience, okay? This is my own personal conviction, okay? So I don't use it for my own personal convenience, but primarily for advancing the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what this authority is primarily to be used for. 
not for personal convenience or personal gain. However, when your personal safety and welfare are at risk, are at stake, do use it. Now, three times the disciples disappointed Jesus. Three times. The first time, they failed to drive the demon out of the boy with epilepsy. The second time, Peter sank into the water. The third time, they failed to rebuke the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Three times. In each case, they failed to do something he fully expected them to do. And what was that? Well, he wanted them to do the miracle. He expected the disciples to cast the demon out of the boy. He expected Peter to be able to walk on water all the way to him. He expected his disciples to rebuke the storm. In each case, what was the reason for their failure? They had little faith. They had little mountain moving faith. They lacked faith of God. They had plenty of faith in God. No problem there. How do we know they had faith in God? Well, when they cried out to Jesus in Matthew 14 and Matthew 8, when, when Peter cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me, I'm going to drown. And when they cried out to Jesus on, this, on the Sea of Galilee, when the storm hit, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Yeah, they had plenty of faith in him, plenty of faith in God, but they lacked faith of God, mountain-moving faith. They lacked faith of God to perform the miracles that Jesus expected them to perform. Sadly, in the church, this faith of God is not taught. And that is one reason why we don't see many miracles on the mission field. That is one reason why missions instead primarily focuses on humanitarian social works in order to draw the lost to Jesus Christ. But we don't see that in the book of Acts, do we? We don't see the early disciples feeding the poor and starting schools and taking care of orphans uh, as part of preaching the gospel. We don't see them, but we see them performing great miracles to draw many Greeks and Romans and Jews to them. We should be doing the same today. But sadly, in the church, we have not been taught mountain-moving faith. Yes, we have been taught faith in God, and that is foundational. That is more important. Yes, absolutely. But with faith of God, then you can do the works of God. You can heal the sick. You can cast out demons. You can make disciples. You can accelerate missions during these last days if you understand faith of God. Now, Jesus would commend outsiders who came with faith that he would heal them. For example, the woman with the bleeding, 12 years of bleeding, she came to Jesus with faith in him. Okay, she had faith in him. If I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus, and she was in fact healed, and Jesus commended her. He said, woman, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So he commended her. In extreme contrast, Jesus would rebuke his disciples for failing to perform miracles because they lack faith of God. You see the contrast between how Jesus treated outsiders and how he treated his disciples. Now, who are we? Are we outsiders or are we disciples? The answer is clear. Why was he so strict with his disciples? Because he was preparing them to take over the great responsibility of fulfilling the Great Commission after he left. He was going to leave them. And the Great Commission would be in their hands. A great, great responsibility. Now, today, we are in the very last days. Before Jesus left, he had to equip and train his disciples to provide incontrovertible evidence to a skeptical world that he was in fact the Messiah. That is, that he was the only way to the one true God who created the universe. And what was that evidence? Incomparably powerful miraculous works. That was the incontrovertible evidence that he was the Messiah. That was the reason for such strict training. 
in the Elijah Challenge training, you are being trained to take on the great responsibility of fulfilling the Great Commission during these very last days and to train others in the body of Christ for the same purpose. You are trainers. You are being trained to be trainers. This is training for special forces of the kingdom of God. Please remember, we are in the last days. There must be acceleration in missions. Missions as recorded in the book of Acts must be restored and even greater if we are going to fulfill the great commission during the short time which remains. So I believe that's why the Lord has given us this understanding of authority and power and mountain moving faith so that we can fulfill the great commission during these very last days when the time is so short, when so much work remains to be done. So where we have been given authority to do something, we should not be afraid. No, but rather we take action as we have been commanded. The theology of helplessness has paralyzed the church for centuries. And what is this theology of helplessness? This theology of helplessness says that we are just sinners saved by grace through faith. There's nothing we can do. All we can do is pray and trust God. And beyond that, you can do nothing. Just pray and trust God for the results. This theology teaches us that in the realm of the supernatural, we are totally helpless. We can do nothing. And that is not true. We have been given authority to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to proclaim the kingdom of God. We are not totally helpless. We can go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and save the lost through the preaching of the gospel. But this theology of helplessness has resulted in the church not having fulfilled the Great Commission after 2,000 long years. Recall that in the book of Acts, the early disciples, within the space of two generations, they took the gospel to the ends of the known world. But since then, something has happened. Tradition has crept into the church, paralyzed the church, such that even after 2,000 years, there still remains so much work to be done. Let me give you a few illustrations of what you can do, okay? Some applications. This is how we have applied this teaching, uh, we and the Elijah Challenge, okay? First of all, let me give you some reports from westernized nations, okay, like the U.S., Australia. And what we do is we apply Luke 10, verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you, okay? I'm going to show you how we actually apply this on the field. Well, the fastest thing is, of course, do this in a Sunday morning in your church. Of course, first you do the training. You can do it on a Friday night and then all day Saturday. You train them how to heal the sick and cast out demons exactly as Jesus did. And then on a Sunday morning, you invite unbelievers who need healing to come to the service. And during that service, you preach the kingdom of God. And then after that, before you invite people to believe in Jesus, you heal the sick. You invite the sick to come forward to be healed. You have your newly trained disciples ready in the front. They lay hands on the sick. And many people are instantly healed. And they testify that they are healed. This woman was deaf in one ear, and her ear was opened. Well, that's my wife standing next to her, by the way. And after that, I said, who wants to believe in Jesus? And people came forward. That church had never seen such miracles. Uh, you can also do this outside in the open air. Uh, there is, There was a park nearby, and uh, it had an apartment complex adjacent to that park. So before the Saturday of our event, we had workers go into that apartment complex, and they handed out flyers. And the flyers said something like, Saturday, come and join us. 
uh, people will be healed, people will hear the gospel, and we will feed you, and there will be games for the children. And so on that Saturday, people came, okay? Before we fed them, of course, before any of the activities, first I proclaimed the kingdom of God to the people who had gathered. After that, I said, okay, we're going to give you evidence that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, that he has authority to forgive your sins. Those of you who want to be healed, come forward and you will be healed by these trained disciples. And after you are healed, you will testify and your testi testimony will be the evidence that Jesus has authority to forgive your sins and grant you eternal life. So people came forward and our newly trained believers laid hands on them and they were healed one by one by one by one by one. They were miraculously healed and they testified. In particular, the man you see on the left in the middle, he was a cocaine addict. He came to the meeting, he heard the gospel, and afterwards he came forward. He wanted to be set free from his addiction. And so our trained believers ministered to him with authority in the name of Jesus. They rebuked that spirit of cocaine addiction. And as they did so, he felt something physical come out of his mouth and take off. Now, what was that thing? It was actually nothing physical, although it felt like it was physical, but it was actually a spirit of cocaine addiction. It came out of his mouth and took off. And after that, he testified. He said, the craving has totally left me. I have no more craving for the cocaine. And that man accepted Jesus Christ. At the very end, after all the testimonies, I gave the altar call and those people you see standing in the front, they all accepted Jesus Christ. They all accepted Jesus Christ. There were other testimonies of healing, of course. So you can do this uh, in many neighborhoods in the United States. Uh, you can go to a minority neighborhood. We have one in Houston called Fifth Ward. You can go there and do an open air event. You can invite people to come on a Saturday morning to be healed. You bring your loudspeaker. People will come and people will hear the gospel and you will heal them. Many people will be healed and then you can get their testimony and people will accept Christ. You do this in the open air. On this particular occasion, a large cancerous tumor shrank as trained believers ministered to this woman in the name of Jesus Christ. You can do an outdoor Christian Christmas festival in certain communities. You see, it gives you an excuse. Christmas time gives you an excuse to gather people together outdoors, okay? You can provide food for them and maybe gifts for the children. And during this event, what do you do? You preach the gospel, you heal the sick, cast out demons, people will be healed except Christ. And then you can bless the people with gifts. There was one meeting that we did in this particular area. There was a pastor's daughter. Her name was Jaden. She was nine years old and she had a congenital heart disease and uh, she was waiting for a heart transplant. Okay. And she had very little energy. But during one of these meetings, outdoor meetings in the fifth ward, one of our trained disciples laid hands on her heart during that meeting. And after that, I said, Jaden, run. Of course, she didn't want to run. So the brother who laid hands on her took her by the hand and they started running. They started running about 100 yards behind to a fence. And then reaching the fence, they turned around and they ran all the way back to us. And I said, Jaden, how do you feel? She says, I feel fine. The brother who had gone with her was huffing and puffing. God did this miracle for a nine-year-old girl in the open air. Prisons, you can go into prisons. You, and in prisons, of course, these meetings, uh, the inmates, uh, they have to go to these meetings, all right, I think. And when you go to these, and when they come, what do you do? You preach the gospel, you heal the sick, and God is very pleased to heal inmates because why? God gives more grace to the humble. And these inmates are very, very humbled. So you will see very powerful miracles taking place in prisons. In this one particular case, 
God did great miracles among the inmates. And that night after the meeting, they were worshiping and praising God in their cells. After the meeting, people repented. They went back to their cells and they were praising God. In Brazil, we went down there. We went to the second most idolatrous city in the country of Brazil. There we trained 600 disciples how to heal the sick and cast out demons. After the training, which took place several days, about a week, then we sent them out in small teams going door to door to door to heal the sick and preach the gospel. They would just go from door to door to door asking, do you have any sick people here? In and in idolatrous places like that, there are many sick people in the homes. And as a result, 1,920 people were healed, mostly in their homes. These were not Catholics, these were idol worshipers. And as a result, 1,440 people accepted Christ in one single week. They had never had this kind of result. And this was not because some big superstar evangelist went down there and had a huge meeting in the crusade. No, it was because 600 nameless, faceless disciples were trained and then they went door to door into the streets, healing the sick and preaching the gospel. You can do this in many countries in the West. In countries in the West, now you have new age festivals and events. And you can go to those events as a sheep dressed in wolves clothing. You go to these, those events. You don't go there as a Christian. You don't go there uh, with a huge cross around your neck holding a huge Bible. No, you go there as a sheep dressed in wolves clothing. They don't know who you are. But you go there, you rent a booth, you put up a sign saying something like free healing. Don't mention anything about God or Jesus. It's a new age festival. Just be completely secular. Well, several years ago, I trained a group of believers in England, post-Christian England, Great Britain. And let me share with you the results, okay? This is what Peter, Peter Papp told me. The healing weekend took place from Thursday to Sunday, and I led a small healing team. This team was trained by us. It is a very dark spirited cult, a cult showcase held in the countryside in the Bristol area in England, organized and run by world famous spiritualist mediums, witches, hypnotherapists, fortune tellers, Reiki healers, and so on. It was quite amazing that we were there and they are believers. It was an awesome and humbling time. Our pitch was great and the stall holders opposite were warm and friendly. They were just selling clothes and jewelry, so we didn't get distracted or affected by dodgy spirits. The rest of the event was packed with a great spectrum of occult and new age practices. Spiritualist mediums competing with each other, tarot card and crystal readers, past life therapists, Reiki healers, fortune tellers, psychic mediums, etc. It was amazing to see how their effectiveness was greatly limited, though. <laughs> One, and that was because of the presence of these newly trained disciples. One of the most famous such mediums told me that he only had seven visitors on the busiest day when he expected crowds. When we had over 50 healings at the same time and several people received Jesus. See, this took place at a New Age festival. You just have to be well-trained and bold. Bold like a lion. 82 infirm people instantly healed. We ministered to a total of 125 people that weekend. The stall holders opposite us who had witnessed all that went on over the three days were telling people, hey, those people... They truly love people. The love of God is the one thing the powers of darkness cannot counterfeit. I believe that was our biggest testimony and the reason why even so many of the healers and the event team sent people to us or came back again because they felt the love of God amongst us. 
Absolutely. Hallelujah. Along with the miracles comes love. Yes, yes, yes. The event organizers even said to people that if they really want to get healed, they needed to come to see us. So you can do that as well, even in a country like Great Britain, which is post-Christians. Now, let me share with you something we did somewhat similar right here in the U.S. Okay. On a certain Friday, this was, I don't know, six, seven years ago, we went to Las Vegas. And in a hotel, we trained a group of believers how to heal the sick and cast out demons. That was on a Friday night and on a Saturday. Sunday morning, I said to them, I don't want you going to church. I want you going out to the strip. I want each team to make a big sign like free miraculous healing, what you see right there. And I want each time to go to the Vegas Strip, hold up that sign, walk around, show the people. <laughs> All right, that's what I had them do. Okay, what happened? Well, this is a testimony from Sister Jan, who came from Wisconsin. I totally agree. The hour on the street was like being caught up in Elijah's whirlwind. For me, it was an easy way to minister to people on the street for several reasons. First, I was in a small group of five people, so I was not alone. Our group was of mixed ages and ethnicity. It seemed ideal as we ministered to Asians, Blacks, Hispanics, and white folks. The diversity of our group seemed to put people we met on the street at ease. We boldly walked the streets, smiling and making eye contact, while one in the group carried a sign saying, Free Miraculous Healing. As people read it, they understood when we asked if they needed healing in any part of their body. Some said no, but many said yes. After the Friday and Saturday training, each person in our group was willing to take the challenge and minister healing in the name of Jesus. I believe the experience exceeded the expectations of our group. Usually one person would speak first and the others in our group would agree. Sometimes the leader would drop back and another would take a turn leading the healing ministry that is issuing commands and laying hands on the sick. After they were miraculously healed, it was a natural transition to ask people if they knew Jesus as Savior. One young man answered, he did not know for sure, so I asked if he would like to pray the prayer of salvation. He said, yes. So I was able to pray with this young man who was a street dancer, part-time stripper, to receive Jesus. See that young man there? He's not wearing a shirt, okay? He is the part-time stripper. At that moment, he was on the street dancing, uh, you know, dancing, doing some extra work, earning some extra money. He was dancing. And so uh, when he saw the sign, Free Miraculous Healing, uh, he had some muscle strains in his body due to his profession as a dancer, I think in his arm and his leg. So he asked for healing. These ladies laid hands on him with power and authority, and he was miraculously healed. And after that, you can see him accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he's still not wearing a shirt. That gives new meaning to the expression, come just as you are. After the Elijah Challenge training in Las Vegas, I realized how easy it is to just ask people if they have any illness and if they would like ministry for healing. This was easier than door-to-door -door evangelism. Like, um, what is the name of that thing? Uh, yeah, EE. EE is door-to-door -door evangelism. Praise God for that. What we add to that is... We heal the sick from door to door, and after the people are healed, guess what? Then they're interested in hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ after they experience the miracle. So many people have pain, and many will take the offer to receive ministry if we just ask them. We did not concern ourselves with those who rejected us. People reject Jesus, they will reject us. People rejected Jesus all the time. We just moved on to the next people coming our way. 
I would do this again, and I would recommend this training to every believer. Thank you, founders of the Elijah Challenge, for surrendering yourselves to God and offering this training. It was so good to meet all of you taking the challenge. We are bolder than before. We have no fear in the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, I'd like to share this. I think this is the last one. In our city of Houston, we have a Chinatown. And in Chinatown, we have something called Hong Kong Hong Kong Mall, Hong, Hong Kong Food Market, okay? Actually, it's called Hong Kong City Mall. If you walk in there, you think you are in Asia somewhere. Everyone is Asian. All the store owners are Asian, okay? And so about 20 years ago, we decided to go down there and do an outreach, okay? Okay, how did we do it? Well, let me share with you. First, I had a sign made, okay, in three languages, Vietnamese, English, and Chinese at the bottom. Now, I made that sign 21 year, 20 years ago. I still have it. But if I were to do the same outreach today, I would not use the word prayer because prayer is too religious. It's like a Christian thing. What I would say is just free miraculous healing instead of healing prayer. Okay. But back then we were just starting out. And so I used the term healing prayer in three, in three languages. I took the sign and I went into the busiest part of the shopping mall and I put the sign on top of a shopping cart so everyone could see it. And then people passing by, when they saw the sign, they would come up to us and ask for healing prayer. Okay, Let me tell you, we saw so many miracles at this shopping mall. Between 80 and 90 percent of the people we ministered to at this mall were miraculously healed after which we shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most dramatic testimony we saw there, and we did this over several weekends. I forget how long, over a few months, we did this every Saturday. Okay, there was this Vietnamese lady named Mrs. Yip. She was an immigrant from Vietnam. And um, one day she started having a physical problem in her stomach. Her stomach was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And she wasn't pregnant. Uh, she started out a size eight, but because her stomach was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually she had to wear a size 16. That's considerable. And so finally, she went to see her Vietnamese doctor. Uh, he lived, his office was on the second story of the Hong Kong City Mall. Uh, during the appointment, he examined her. Uh, he felt her stomach and it was hard, hard like a rock. And he realized this is serious. And he said, you have to come back, Mrs. Yip. Uh, I want to do a Koskan, uh, Koskan, uh, whatever, Koskanolopy, or Koskan, <laughs> I can't say that, colonoscopy. I have to do a colonoscopy, so I need you to come back. So she left the doctor's office. She went down to the first floor, and I believe she wasn't feeling very well. Maybe she was feeling under the sentence of death because whatever it was, was not good news. As she walked along uh, the mall, she saw our sign, the sign that you see right there, and she came, to, came up to us. Uh, with me was a Vietnamese brother named Jordan Yip, okay, and she spoke to Jordan. She told us that she had a problem in her stomach. She didn't tell us exactly the nature of the problem, but she said, you know, I need healing for, our, for my stomach. So Jordan and I, we laid hands on her stomach, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we rebuked the infirmity, whatever it was. As we rebuked this infirmity, Mrs. Yip, she felt something leaking out of her, well, you know, where a woman doesn't want to be leaking, she felt something leaking out. So she reached down and she touched herself, and it was totally dry. Nothing was leaking out. But then... She felt her size 16 pants beginning to drop off. She had to catch her pants. What happened? Well, she shrank. She shrank from a size 16 back to a size 8. And that's why her pants were starting to fall off. Whatever that thing was disappeared. Mrs. Yip accepted Jesus Christ. 
Later, she started going to church. I believe she was a Catholic, okay, at first. She started going to an evangelical church. She came to our training. And then after that, she went on a mission trip back to Vietnam. And on the plane back to Vietnam, she was witnessing to the other passengers about Jesus Christ. After arriving in Vietnam, she went to her home village. There was a small church there, very small church of a few people. And she began sharing her testimony of what God had done for her in Houston. And she, and I was told that that church exploded to 500 people overnight because of her testimony. And then God began to use her to lay hands on the sick and heal them in Jesus' name as evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. That was all a fruit of what happened in Hong Kong City Mall on a Saturday. This was about 20 years ago. Okay. Let me just share with you a couple of things about COVID-19 here, okay, before we close. This is a testimony that we received from someone who was healed. After returning home from a trip to Bhubaneswar, the capital of our state of Odisha, also known as Orissa, this man, can't pronounce his name, Manaranjan, came down with a fever and a cough which persisted for a few days, and he felt very weak. A subsequent COVID test was positive, leaving Manaranjan stricken with anxiety. He contacted our Elijah Challenge workers. After they ministered to him in the wondrous name of Jesus, Manaranjan was miraculously healed from the horrible virus. Gratefully, he put his faith in Jesus Christ. This happened just last week, I think. One more. For a few days, sister, she's a believer, Sister Indumati, a new believer, had fever, coughing, and vomiting. She then tested positive for COVID. Her condition was serious, but her family did not let us know. The day before yesterday, when she was in the final stage of COVID, her husband called us over the phone. They have two baby boys, and hearing the news about Indumati, we were beyond concerned. Now, the one who is writing this is our coordinator in the state of Orissa. Despite the restrictions on visiting people with the virus, my wife and I rushed over to their home and ministered to Indumati in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. By that time, she had just about lost hope and had committed her life into God's hands. When we arrived, she was vomiting uncontrollably. But as soon as we ministered to her, she stopped vomiting. vomiting. God was merciful and he healed Indumati. Praise the Lord. And so we know that God has given us authority to heal people with COVID-19. So let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's not put our light under a lampshade or, or hide somewhere. Let's go out boldly and heal people who have COVID-19. Now, next week, we are going to study the book of Acts. So please come back and we will study the book of Acts. What, how did the early disciples in the book of Acts heal the sick and cast out demons? Did they only use the gift of healing and no longer use power and authority we will see so come back a week from today to see how the early disciples healed the sick in the book of acts after the holy spirit came and the gifts of the healing including the gift of healing were now available so hope to see you in one week